Thank you so much, uh, Rachel and uh, Tarjan, and uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by taking you back to 1979. At that time, I was doing my military service in Norway as a conscript. And I remember uh, very clearly uh, the exercises we conducted to protect ourselves against a nuclear attack. When I would hear the nuclear alarm, I was taught to put on my jacket, my hood, and my gloves to cover my skin, and to duck and cover. In case we survived the initial blast, we actually had to, we had a brush to clear the radioactive dust as quickly as possible uh, from uh, our uh, clothes. So um, that was the way we prepared for a nuclear attack in Norway in 1979. We exercised again and again uh, because the anxiety uh, of a nuclear war was very real at that uh, time. This was when the deployment of Soviet SS-20 missiles was a profound concern uh, for all of us. That is why, at the same time, uh, NATO took the famous dual-track decision to deploy new nuclear uh, missiles in Europe in response to the Soviet threat, while at the same time reaching out for dialogue and arms control uh, negotiations. As well as, uh, as we all know, the deployment of uh, uh, U.S. missiles was controversial. Protests shook uh, the political landscape across the whole of Europe. But in the end, this dual-track uh, decision prepared the ground for the INF uh, Treaty. And when the treaty was signed in 1987, we all felt safer and we were safer. So arms control matters, it enhances our security, but today we see that global arms control, the global arms control architecture that has served us so well is eroding. We have seen this most recently with the demise of the INF uh, Treaty. For years Russia has deployed uh, intermediate range ground-launched missiles in Europe violating the treaty. These missiles are mobile, easy to hide, and able to reach European cities with limited warning time. Russia ignored repeated calls over several years from NATO allies to return to compliance. No treaty can keep us safe if it's just respected by one side. Russia's negative record, record on arms control goes beyond the INF Treaty. It suspended its participation in the Convention of Forces in Europe Treaty back in 2007, a treaty which all NATO allies continue to comply with. Russia also has a record of, of circumventing the OCE Bayana document, which provides for inspections of military activities and exercises and reduces risks of in unintentional conflict. In fact, Russia has never opened an exercise for mandatory OCE Vienna document observation. But this is a problem which goes beyond Russia. It's not just about Russia. It's also about uh, other players fielding nuclear weapons and advanced missile systems. North Korea and um, Iran, for example, are blatantly ignoring or, or bre 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 breaking the global rules and spreading dangerous missile technology around the world. Also, the shifting balance of uh, power, the global balance of power, and the rise of China has implications for the existing arms control regime. China now has the world's second biggest defense budget and it is increasing uh, the size and the sophistication of its missile arsenal. China already has hundreds of missiles with a range that would have been prohibited by the INF Treaty. And recently, it put on display an advanced intercontinental nuclear missile able to reach the United States and Europe. 
a new supersonic cruise missile, an assortment of new drones and anti-ship missiles. This shows the world how far China has come. But let me underline, China is not violating any arms control treaty. But as a major military power, it has major responsibilities. And it is time for China to participate in arms control. Emerging technologies are also changing the game. Arms control has traditionally been about counting warheads, controlling numbers and distances. This is still relevant, but there are new threats on the field. Cyber, hypersonic glide, drones, autonomous uh, weapon platforms, artificial intelligence and biotech. They can all be weaponized. And in general, their military use is not constrained by international rules and regulations. This also shows that the arms control architecture is under serious stress from Russia, from new players, and from new technologies. So if arms control is to remain effective, it needs to adapt. I see four areas where we could act together to reflect these new realities. We need to preserve and implement the non-proliferation treaty. We need to adapt nuclear arms control regimes to new realities. We need to modernize the Vienna document. And we need to consider how to develop new rules and standards for emerging technologies including advanced missile technology. So first on the NPT. NATO's goal is a world without nuclear weapons. And the non-proliferation treaty is the only way to achieve this. The fundamental bargaining of the NPT remains sound. That all states will work towards general and complete disarmament so a world without nuclear weapons. All states will work to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons, and all states can access the benefits of the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. For 50 years, the NPT has limited the spread of nuclear weapons. The nuclear ban treaty is not a viable substitute. The ban treaty has no mechanism to ensure the balanced reduction of weapons, no mechanism for verification, and it undermines the NPT. So with regimes such as North Korea and uh, um, um, so with regimes such as North Korea that continue to seek and develop these weapons, preserving and implementing the NPT is critical. The review conference next April is a major opportunity for the international community to do exactly that. We must all seize this opportunity and give political energy to our commitment under the NPT. It's a matter for the security, not only for NATO allies, but for the whole world. Second, we must adapt the nuclear arms control regime to new realities. The INF Treaty eliminated a whole category of weapons capable of carrying nuclear warheads. As a direct consequence, almost 3,000 missiles were destroyed. When the first START Treaty entered into force in 1994, the US and Russia were limited to 6,000 strategic offensive arms each. Now, under the new START, they are limited to no more than 1,550 each. These treaties have worked. They have built up trust, promoted transparency, and cut down the number of nuclear weapons. They have made our world a safer place. We have to keep what we have built and maintain the gains made through these treaties. In a post-INF world, NATO will do, its, do this by responding in a defensive, measured, and coordinated way 
to the new Russian missile threat. We have seen Russian calls for a moratorium on the deployment of nuclear armed cruise missiles in Europe. This is not a credible proposal. It disregards the reality on the ground. Russia has already deployed its new missile system in violation of the IMF treaty. So unless and until Russia verifiably destroys the new system, the moratorium on deployments is not a real offer. However, and at the same time, we aspire for a constructive relationship with Russia. That is why we keep the door open for a meaningful dialogue to build trust and hopefully lay the ground for renewed progress on arms control. We also need to look beyond bilateral agreements between Russia and the United States. We must find ways uh, to include other countries, such as China. I am firmly convinc uh, convinced that China, like the rest of the world, stands to benefit from increased transparency and predictability. It might take time to get the parties to the table. I'm not saying that this will be easy, but it's the right thing to do. And let's not forget that it took a decade to negotiate the NPT and seven years to negotiate the INF Treaty, and many years to get the parties to the table. So we need to work on this because transparency and predictability are the foundations for international security. Third, we must modernize the Vienna document. There are more military activity in Europe than we have seen for decades. So NATO allies and our partners have agreed on proposals for the most comprehensive modernization package of the Vienna document since 1994. To reduce the risk of miscalculation and accidents on land, at sea and in the air. To give greater transparency to SNAP exercises by allowing SNAP inspections. And to tightening verification procedures that have not been modernized and improved in the last 25 years. These proposals have just been presented to all participating states of the OCE in Vienna. And we count on all OCE members to engage in a constructive manner. This package, which we have presented, aims to restore confidence, build mutual predictability, reduce risks, and help prevent unintentional conflict in Europe. Fourth, we need to consider how to develop new rules and standards and apply them to the spread of emerging technologies, including advanced missile technology. Emerging technologies present challenges and opportunities. Hypersonic missiles, autonomous weapon systems, and offensive cyber capabilities are being developed specifically for military use. And these technologies can have strategic effect. Of course, we cannot count algorithms as we do warheads. But we need transparency and predictability in this area as well. For example, by developing norms on the military application of certain new technologies. At the same time, uh, we should also be harnessing some of these technologies to conduct arms control in more effective and less intrusive ways and improve our verification capabilities. For example, much uh, is already being done with commercial satellite imagery to keep track of North Korean missile tests. We also need to develop new tools to limit the spread of advanced missile technology. So to be concrete, we are working on two sets of proposals. First, on how allies can better contribute to disarmament and uh, disarmament uh, verification, including through the use of new technologies. And second, on how arms control can help allies contribute to addressing the proliferation of missiles 
and the spread of new missile technologies like hypersonic glide. NATO has a long track record of promoting arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. At the first NATO summit in 1957, leaders stated that they would take all necessary action to restrict armaments while ensuring allies' security. And 10 years later, allies agreed to the Harmel report, which highlighted the two main functions of NATO. One is to deter aggression and defend alliance territory. The other is to seek dialogue. So arms control is in NATO's DNA. Through the decades, the united position and collective efforts of allies helped secure unprecedented international commitments that have kept all our nations safe. We supported the development of many bilateral, regional and global agreements. Allies helped to negotiate the NPT treaty at our old, head, at our old headquarters down the street. The United States worked closely with its uh, NATO allies on SALT 1 and 2, INF, START 1 and 2, and the new START treaty. NATO also provided the platform to negotiate, agree, and implement the conventional arms control regimes, the OSCE Vienna document, the CFE treaty, and the Open Skies treaty and allies continue to remain in full compliance with these regimes today. These agreements have demonstrated that good implementation does create trust, mutual confidence, and predictability. So ladies and gentlemen, these are tough times for arms control, but we have gone through tough times before. In the past, it took patience, determination, and commitment to reach landmark agreements. NATO will and must play its part to ensure arms control remains an effective tool for our collective security now and in the future. NATO allies remain firmly committed to the preservation of effective international arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. And by bringing together civilians and military officers, experts on nuclear and conventional from allied and partner countries, NATO provides a unique platform for discussions on the future of arms control. Our aim is clear, to uphold and strengthen the global rules-based order, to avoid an arms race, and to prevent war. Thank you so much.